This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good evening. This is the planning board meeting of May, uh, or I'm sorry, April, wait, May. May 18th. I have the wrong date on this. Um, okay, my name is Suzanne Cahill. I'm the planning director for the city of Kingston and the organizer for the virtual meeting this evening. Um, before we begin this meeting, uh, I just want to go over a few guidelines to help navigate through the meeting efficiently and respectfully. Uh, we ask that all members of the public and press remain muted and off camera for the length of the meeting. As the organizer, I reserve the right to mute anyone who unmutes themselves. Board members and city staff will control their own mute button. As good practice, we ask that you mute yourself if you are not speaking to avoid background noise and feedback. If a board member or staff wishes to speak, they will raise their hands. The chairperson will call on them before they speak by stating their name clearly for our audio listeners. The board member will then unmute themselves, state their name and speak clearly, muting after finished. All of our meetings are being recorded. Both video and written transcriptions will be made available to the public on the city's website at a later date. In lieu of public speaking during the monthly meeting, we requested all comments to be received by 2 p.m. on Friday, May 15th of 2020. Comments could have been emailed to Suzanne Cahill, Planning Director at skahill at kingston-ny.gov or mailed or placed in the Dropbox outside of City Hall. Written comments received specific to any public hearings were strongly encouraged and will be read at the beginning of said hearing discussion if any were received. The public is invited to speak via audio connection at the time of the, he at the, time the hearing is called. The chairman will announce the names of all who submitted comments and where they can be located for the public viewing on the City of Kingston's website. If you have audio issues, please send a text message to the following number, 845-443-0416. I will repeat this number again, but be aware that phone calls will not be answered during the meeting. The number again to text is 845-443-0416. As the organizer for today's meeting, I reserve the right to lock and pause the meeting to eject anyone who has behaved inappropriately or to enter into an attorney-client conference, if needed. Materials for this meeting may be found on the City of Kingston website, www.kingston-ny.gov. Once you are on the home page, scroll to the bottom under meetings, and where you see the planning board meeting posted, click on the agenda packet. Thank you for your patience during these difficult times, and on behalf of the planning board, I wish you and your family good health, I now turn the floor over to Chairman Wayne Platt to call the meeting to order. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, good, evening, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is the City of Kingston Planning Board uh, meeting, May 18th, 2020. Uh, time is now 6.09 p.m. Uh, we will begin with introductions. Uh, my name is Wayne Platt, I'm the chairman. We also have Charles Polacco, the vice chairman. Robert Jacobson, Mary Jo Wiltshire, Matt Gillis, Kevin Roach, Vince Archer, and we also have the planning director for the city of Kingston, Suzanne Cahill. We have the assistant planner, Kyla D. Day. We also have the Common Council liaison to the Planning Board, Alderman Don Tollerman. And we also have the City of Kingston Assistant Corporation Council, Daniel Gartenstein. Welcome, everybody. Um, moving on to regular business, uh, adoption of the April 18th, 2020 Planning Board meeting minutes. Has everybody had an opportunity to take a look at them? Any, does anybody have any questions or deletions or uh, additions that are needed at this time? Please raise your hand so Sue can, can call on you. We're all good, Sue? No one is raising their hands. Okay. Okay, so at this time, I will make a motion that we adopt the April 18th, 2020 planning board minutes. 
Uh, do I have a second? Robert. Second by Chuck. Robert. Yeah. Robert Jacobs. Second. Yes. Okay. Uh, roll call. All in favor. Wayne Platt Jr. is a yes. Charles Baraka. Charles is a yes. Robert Jacobson. Is Robert? Robert, you need to unmute yourself. He's giving the thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Gillis? Yes. Okay. Okay. That uh, motion is adopted and carried. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to public hearings. Uh, item number two is number 69 Spring Street. It's a special permit renewal for a two room bed and breakfast. Section block and lot is 56.42-7-14. Seeker determination, zone RT. It's in the Roundout West Historic District, Ward 8. Maribel Rodriguez is the applicant owner. Sue, do we have anybody besides uh, Ms. Rodriguez uh, online to speak about item number two? I do not believe so. Maribel is on. Okay. Hi, Belle. Hello. How are you? Reading. Hanging in there like the rest of us. Good, good. Um, okay, so the original proposal, the original permit was granted in February 2004 and has been renewed annually with the, with the most recent being April of last year. Have there been any changes to your operation there? Yes, it's dead. <laughs> My goose is cooked. <laughs> Nothing going on. No changes. I have made that. Okay. Okay. All right. And um, Sue, uh, as in last month's meeting with the residential uh, uh, renewals that we've had, uh, are we still lacking a inspection report from Building Safety? Yes, that is correct. That restriction has not yet been lifted. So, Bell, what we've been doing is, um, if there's nothing else that's jumping out at us, uh, we've been tabling these types of applications until building safety is uh, able to come back and complete their inspection, okay? Okay. Um, doesn't mean that you're, you know, that you're not going to be able to operate. It just means we're just waiting for that report. Does anybody else have any, have any questions for, for Bell at this time? Robert? I just want to make sure that once we have these inspections moving forward, we're not going to require the applicants to come back to the board for the actual meeting. We'll just be able to vote since we've had an opportunity to ask questions tonight. Yes, we have said that in the past. Good point, Robert. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Um, we can make that a... Uh, um, a uh, contingent upon uh, building safety approval, right? So that's what we can do tonight. If you and want, to, yes, you can put that in your application or in your motion. Everybody comfortable with that? Making that a condition of approval? Thumbs up, everybody. Okay. All right. Yes. I can't see. I'm relying on Sue here. Okay. Um, let me see here. And Bell, as in the previous approvals, uh, we're only allowed to do one year terms on these because it's a bed and breakfast, okay? Um, so, okay. Um, so under seeker, it's a type two action, so no further review of the board is required at this time. Uh, so at this time, I will make a motion that we approve item number two for a period of one year uh, with the condition that they have, uh, Bell has a favorable inspection from Building Safety Division when that inspection does occur. Uh, and all the original conditions will be carried forward. Uh, so that is a motion. Do I have a second on that? Robert? Second. Robert J. for the second? Okay. I saw Robert T. go up first. All right. So uh, all in favor, Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Polacco? Charles Palacco is yes. Robert Jacobson? 
Yes. Mary Jo Wiltshire. Yes. Pat Gillis. Yes. Okay, that motion is approved. And so, uh, yeah, Bell, we're just going to be waiting for that inspection to occur. And I, I appreciate you taking your time out to come tonight. Thank you very much. Question, they will confer with me first, right? Before the inspection, I'm really, I'm being very careful not to let anyone in my house during the pandemic. Maribel, uh, this is this is Sue Cahill. Yes, Maribel, they will contact you and schedule an appointment to do the inspection. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, thank Be you, Bell. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Bye. All right. Uh, item number three is 20 Cedar Street. It's a special permit to install. Is this correct? to install and operate an antenna? Yes, Wayne. For the purposes of providing community Wi-Fi, section block and lot is 56.109-4-2.100, secret determination, zone C2, mixed use overlay district, ward four, Radio Kingston is the applicant, Rupco is the owner. Uh, Sue, do we have anybody on the line uh, wishing to speak on item number three? Yes, we have Scott Dutton. If you could unmute yourself and turn your video on, and Kale Kapashlin, if you could do the same, unmute yourself and turn your video on, please. Hi. Hi, Scott. Hey, Wayne. Good to see you. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, also, we have Chuck. Well, no, we'll go on to Chuck later, but go ahead, Scott. Do we, is Scott here to, to talk about the, the project or the plan, or is, is it a... Actually, Kayla is going to make the presentation. I just helped facilitate because we had the drawings um, from the uh, Energy Square project to make the illustration. But Sue, we don't have anybody wishing to speak on this other than the applicant owner, right? No. Okay. So also we have uh, Chuck Snyder here, too. Hi, Chuck. Hey, how are you? Good. All right. Um, okay, folks, go ahead. Kale, okay, do you want me to give you a quick introduction? Sure. Sure. Okay. So, uh, thanks for having us tonight. This is uh, this is an interesting paradigm on the planning board level, but um, I'm not sure I like it better than uh, sitting at City Hall with all of you. Um, we're about a month away from opening the doors at uh, Energy Square, and I can say that um, this application came to me about a week before the world went uh, left and everybody else went right. Early March, Radio Kingston came to uh, Rupco and Energy Square um, and asked if they could put an antenna on the roof to be able to pro provide all of our tenants with free Wi-Fi. Um, through, I, I believe, a generous grant. I don't want to take Kale's uh, win, but I think Novo has supported the effort to uh, distribute Wi-Fi broadly to Midtown Kingston and um, Energy Square now as a very tall point in that neighborhood um, was an obvious place to put an antenna to both distribute to our tenants as well as other points in Midtown. Um, it's a fantastic win. As you guys know, we're putting affordable housing on the market and um, there's no utility costs. The building is net zero building. So the tenants won't get an electric or a gas bill. And at this point, if, if, we, if we're successful with putting this Wi-Fi in, they'll also be able to receive free Wi-Fi. It's a fantastic uh, benefit to the tenants of the building. So with that, I'll let, uh, I'll let Kale explain the uh, the intricacies of the program. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kale. Uh, you probably usually see me behind a camera in uh, the top floor in the council chambers, um, helping out with the meetings. But in, today, I'm here as the technical director of Radio Kingston because we've been incubating this project uh, that we refer to as the Kingston Equitable Internet Initiative. And they're uh, on the top of our tower right now uh, out on Albany Avenue is some basic, uh, what's called WiMAX, similar to Wi-Fi, but it uh, generates a stronger signal. And uh, the goal, as Chuck said, is to explore whether it's possible to provide 
parts of uh, Midtown Kingston and potentially further with uh, sort of sovereign access to the internet, an internet uh, wireless network that is built for the community and managed and governed by the community. And uh, it's a project that we've seen be very successful in other places like Detroit. And uh, we're in the early stages of it. Energy Square was an obvious first node in the building of a network because it's all new construction. And uh, we're able to uh, work with the, uh, I believe 52 tenants within the building to see how effectively we can bring access to the internet to them. There's a great diversity in, within the building, which helps us to determine the best users for an offering of this type. And we're excited to do it. Uh, it did require uh, putting up a basic 25 foot mast, similar to the one that I think is over on the water department. And you kind of see them around schools just to hold a small receiver to receive that signal from the tower over on Albany Avenue and then uh, run the signal into the building. Uh, to the basement where it will then be distributed out. It won't just be Wi-Fi, it will actually uh, bring internet to the homes of the residents and to the couple of nonprofits that are there. Uh, we're excited about it. It's the first step in what we think will be a really wonderful project for the community. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about it um, or related to the mast, which is sort of just a, you know, holds the equipment that we need. Well, thanks for that overview there. Um, uh, and it's great that Radio Kingston wants to provide the free Wi-Fi service to all the occupants there. That's great. Um, Sue, I'm looking at the picture here at the bottom of the page. Um, it's really not that, it's not obtrusive, is, is it the, the mass that we're dealing with, this antenna? Is that, is that what I'm looking at properly here? Yes, you are. And it's actually, that view is the south elevation. So that view would be from like the Greenkill Avenue view. Okay. Um, does anybody? It looks pretty straightforward to me. I mean, it's not something that's going to be like uh, the whole the building. It's pretty straightforward, like I said. Anybody? Have, does anybody else Kevin, have any questions? Kevin Roach. Just a quick question: Is there going to be a light on the top of the tower? No, there's no plans for uh, a light at this height. Very good. Thank you. Be mostly because I'd see it out of the window I'm looking at right now. I'd rather not see, I already see the little red blinking light on the top of the, your radio tower. I just don't want to see another one. Thank you. Understood. Me neither. Wayne. Yes. Wayne, this is Sue. I just got a text and I'm being asked to, when people speak, before you speak, please remember to identify yourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? No questions, okay. Wayne. Oh, Don, uh, Alderman Tallerman. Hi, thank you. This is Don Tallerman. Um, Kale, how far can it broadcast? If you, what's, what's, the, what's the, the maximum range? Hi, Don. Uh, it totally depends on the equipment that's mounted to the tower. In our case, we're just receiving at this point uh, and then sending the signal down into the building. But there's a variety of different types of transmission devices that can either send the signal for a very long distance uh, more in a straight line or can broadcast it out in an omnidirectional pattern to be received by uh, you know, people on the street, for example. Uh, a pretty common distance for uh, a basic type of wireless access point of this type would be around 600 feet but there's a huge variety of options available in terms of uh, how they send the signal. Uh, so uh, be happy to discuss that further with you or point you in the direction of the manufacturer. They're called Ubiquity. And uh, it's the same equipment that we use over at the Deet Stadium to broadcast the Stockade FC soccer games, same type of equipment that was used to bring access over to Ellenville recently. Uh, but in this case, we would just be receiving initially. And then depending on how that goes, be able to discuss the possibility of sending it in other directions from there, either to the top of another building or downward into the community based on where uh, need is and need is expressed and or desired. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? No more. Um, we're gonna discuss a term, so what, what is, what does staff recommend for a term for this? This is Wayne Platt speaking, by the way. 
Um, I would recommend five years to start. Okay. Is everybody, this is Wayne Platt again. Is everybody good with that? Okay. Yes. All right. All right. And uh, KL, Scott, and Chuck, as you know, technologies change, you know, the, the style of, of antenna could change. If that happens within these five years, you folks can come back and and uh, amend your application um, at that time. So, um, so yeah. Um, all right. So under seeker, this is a unlisted action. So a determination of environmental significance will need to be rendered. Kylie, you have a short environmental assessment form there. She's saying yes. Yes. Uh, I don't have one in front of me, but it's. Uh, are you, it, it, are you, can you confirm that it is in order for me? She's, Kyla says yes. Thank you. Um, so at this time, I will make a motion that we uh, approve the uh, environmental assessment form. Uh, Wayne Platt is a yes. Uh, Charles Polacco. Wait, this is Sue. You need a wet. Uh, you need Charles a second. Charles Polacco is a yes. Wayne, this Who, is Sue. Yes. Wayne, you no, need I, to I, have I, a second on your motion. That's what I'm trying to do right now. Hey, I'm sorry. Do I have a second on that motion? Charles Polacco, no. yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so. All in favor? Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Polacco? Yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Gary Joe Wiltshire? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Okay, that is that is adopted. Thank you. Um, so at this time, I will make a motion that we approve item number three for a period of five years. Uh, and the applicant will return if technology changes that a uh, different type of uh, antenna will need to be installed. Uh, we need board policy six to be signed. And anything else, Sue? This is Sue, no. Okay, thank you. So this is Wayne Platt again. So that is a motion. Do I have a second on that motion? Mary Jo. Second by Mary Jo Wiltshire. All in favor? Wayne Flat is a yes. Charles Polacco? Yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Mary Jo Wiltshire? Yes. Pat Gillis? Yes. The motion is adopted. Thank you, folks. KL, Scott, and Chuck. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care now. Thank you. You too. All right, moving on. This now we're into old business. Item number four is 23 Craig. This is commit apartments in the mixed district. Section block and light is 48.330 Seeker determination zones to mixed use overlay district. It's in this talk. Word two. Megan C. Barron is the applicant. Tree 2X Incorporated is the owner. All right. Um, Wayne, this we have is Ginny. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, sir. Um, if you are on as just a caller, would you please mute yourselves? I did. Okay. Hi, Jenny. Hello. Hello, everybody. Did I pronounce, pronounce that yes, correctly? That was, perfect. that was perfect. Thank you. Jenny, do you have anybody else with you as part of your team for this? Yes, uh, in fact, Jordan Valdina, he is my architect and he'll be speaking for me this evening. Hi, Jordan. Hello. 
All right, so this is a space you want to accept. Um, and it's for two residential units on the upper. Is that correct? Yes, converting from office space to a two bedroom apartment proposed on the second floor and a one bedroom apartment opposed, uh, proposed on the currently attic level to be converted to a third floor. Uh, apartment by raising portions of the roof. I can share uh, visuals if you want me to. If yes, to please do. Up. Thank you. Okay. And reading further ahead in here, George and Jeannie, I also see you have uh, historic landmarks approval for the exterior changes. Correct. Everybody can see these visuals. Yes, no one is raising, this is Sue, no one's raising their hand that they can't. Okay. Uh, so there's adequate parking on site here, Sue? Uh, that is a question. Um, the, the architect had stated there were eight spaces available, but you know we were at we did we conducted our site visit. Uh, there are not eight spaces on that lot. Um, we had requested additional information. I don't believe we received that. Uh, uh, yeah, so there was a misunderstanding if somebody quoted me as, as saying there was eight on site. <clears throat> There's one on site, existing, no change. Uh, of course, two people, even three, can back in, but that's not a legit parking because they block, block the people behind them in. So it's one space on site. This was a uh, commercial uh, use space, as you know, office first and second floor. And if what I was wanting to present and hear the planning board's feedback on this, the calculated number of spaces that was would be uh, counted for for that use in the square footage was was eight spaces, and the uh new use when you when you use the formulas in the zoning code for the apartments the conversion of apartments on the second and third floor tally to uh plus the off the plus commercial on the first floor tally again to eight in other words no change so i wanted to hear how that gets handled um have you been in touch uh, you probably have been in touch with Eric Kitchen, right? The zoning enforcement officer? Not separately. Um, I, I know that if, if this were a new construction, of course, we would be seeking a variance for off-site off parking, but I didn't know for a for the same, uh, no change in required number of spaces, what our path should be. Well, uh, Sue, can you offer some insight on that? What, what's, what's your take on that? Yes, um, this is Sue. Um, normally, when there is a change of use and an applicant comes to the planning board with that change um, and there is not an increase in the number of parking spaces, then it is, um, it's left at the way it is stands. Okay. Is the rest of the, I mean, that, the rest of the board is good with that then? Like, we got a thumbs up here at all? I can't okay. add scan. Yes. It makes things simple, right? Good. Yep. All right. So parking is, is handled, right? Uh, any, uh, let's see, we're looking, I'm looking through my, my uh, bullets here too, Jordan. Uh, refuse and recycling, how would that be handled? Um, the current thought uh, is the city. A curbside pickup. Um, however, if we were to consider uh, 
you know, how, how are things handled that relate to minor uses on site? Not to belittle them, I'm saying a relative small square footage. I mean, even things like condensers for heat pumps, um, they're, they're not specifically allocated and shown on the site plan. So uh, that is the current plan with refuse, but I wanna make sure that if we do propose something that we, of course, how we fold fold that in to present, you know. <clears throat> um, so that's the current thought with res refuse. But um, what level of detail, I suppose, if if we wanted to do uh, some temporary or outdoor storage, uh, you know, near the deck, for example, the handicap deck, um, would we need to come back, give you updated plans? Because uh, these things kind of require some thought, even even considering something like a generator, which I'm getting ahead of myself or not. Uh, I'm thinking about the heating and cooling solutions that are kind of evolving before us as we speak, even though the intention is clear, um, it all relates. And so the, the best use might be to enclose something on site, even though the current thinking is city curbside pickup. So kind of a question in there for, for the planning board. Uh, this is Sue uh, speaking, Jordan. I think what the board is asking is where the storage, how how refuse will be stored on site. So if it's going to be stored outside of the building and then brought out to the curb for pickup, they want to know where it's going to be stored and that it will be screened appropriately because if it's in the rear, it's viewed from several of the adjacent properties. Understood. Um, yeah, I guess what I was trying to highlight is there's a couple there's a couple of considerations that might dovetail together that do relate to mundane yet taking this is a very small lot uh, things as placements of condensers. And so I guess I was asking what level of detail would the planning board like to see aside from uh, Trash. I, I understand for an enclosed dumpster, I would show you proposed fencing and the like. That's not the current proposal. Um, but as we account for every square foot on this site, that might be a, a good thing that goes hand in hand, for example, with where the condensers are to be placed. So uh, my question to the planning board is, what would you like to see next in regards to to some of those basically mechanical uh, components affixed on the site that might have an implication for how we think about trash is my point. That's why I'm saying it together. Well, and this is Wayne Platt. Um, I think that, I mean, for me personally, I think that a, a, a storage shed that you're going to propose would, would trigger a, a planning board approval on something like that. But as far as, as, as far as condensers or, and maybe even a generator too would, would 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 fall under our our purview, but you're also going to need to consider going back to historic landmarks um, because they're going to want some input on how those installations are going to be viewed, um, you know, from the street or from other areas that you know would would fall under their jurisdiction. Um, now, so would that be something that uh, would would be a question for Eric Kitchen uh, when that when that time arises. For this is Sue. Are you talking about the location or if it would need to come back? Um, local, 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 not, whether or not it has to go before landmarks um, or and or before the planning board, whatever he's proposing. I mean, the only thing I think that would jump out that would require him to come back to us would be, you know. Uh, would be that storage shed wherever that's going to be proposed that's a, that's a change to site plan right if it's or, this too again if it's a physical structure jordan that you would be um erecting on on location then that would trigger a again coming back to the planning board if you were on the other hand if you were to only designate an area where the refuse containers would be held and then an enclosure, I think that would be something that we could handle at staff level from the planning board perspective. Um, it's going to be a matter of 
how visually how it's constructed and where it's constructed as to whether or not it would need to go back to Landmarks Preservation Commission. Okay, regarding condensers, that discussion, uh, even though you don't see them on the elevations, um, was that was covered with HLPC. However, yes. the possibility of making changing something with outdoor, uh, not structure, but enclosure of refuse. I wouldn't want to discuss that further uh, with Ginny, but as it stands, it it is as shown and it would only go out for curbside pickup and the condensers are next to the, would be next to the handicapped deck and HLPC uh, was okay with that, just on the basis of saying so <laughs> up to date. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I, this is Sue again. Yes, um, I was on that meeting, so you are correct, Jordan. Okay. All right. Um, any, anything else, Sue, for, for, for Jordan and Ginny? I do not have anything. Anybody, this is Wayne Platt again. Anybody else on the board have any questions? I see Mary Jo's raising her hand. Uh, yeah, regarding the, the, this is Mary Jo Wiltshire, uh, regarding the refuse, um, just so you're aware, um, one tote would be supplied, one brown garbage tote would be supplied by the city. If you're having more than one unit there, you're probably going to need more than one brown tote, which you would need to purchase. Um, so just be aware that you could have up to, you know, three brown totes and then enough for recycling. So maybe each unit will have its own recycling and garbage tote. So um, that could be quite a few totes that need to be stored on the side of that building or somewhere on the property. Good, good point. Okay, we need to, we need to come up with a, with a plan that's maybe better than just uh, residential tenants keeping it in oh no i see what you're saying they would all need a tote regardless they might you know i don't know how many you know people will be in each unit um you know sometimes they can share a tote if it's like one person per unit um but if it's probably more than one person per unit you're probably going to need at least minimally two brown totes possibly up to three and then you need one for your co-mingled recycling and one for your paper and cardboard. We have two separate, you know, two separate recycling containers. So, um, yeah, so it could it could be quite a few totes depending on how many people are living there. Okay, good good point. So we need to figure out exactly the number of totes and actually have a strategic plan for totes and therefore where are they and therefore how are they enclosed. So right. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Anybody else from our board have any questions? Robert's got his hand up. Robert Jacobson. Is this something with respect to the garbage and the air conditioning units we can just leave on staff level? I this is Sue. I would not have a problem with that. Yeah, I don't, I don't I don't really see why this would have to come back to us. Obviously, I think it's I don't want to speak for the board, but certainly we don't want to see totes and, and air conditioning units directly in front of the building on the street side, but you know, certainly on the side where there's driveways or in the rear, which is appropriate and appropriate screening, I think this can be left on staff level based on um, the complexities of, of, of having the applicant have to come back to the board just for garbage. This is Wayne Platt, I agree, Robert. And, uh, and uh, like Jordan had said that they've already been before uh, landmarks and and already mentioned these these elements of the, of the project too so um, it sounds like they don't have a problem with everybody everybody else is good with staff level handling thumbs up from everybody okay yes. good okay thank you um, all right uh, anything else sue you've got anything else I do not no all right, uh, so I see here staff would recommend this. Again, this is a special permit, so we need to establish a term. Um, Jordan and Ginny, uh, typically we, you know, with a new, with a new uh, application, uh, staff recommends doing an initial one-year term just to see how things go. 
And as you come back to the next meeting a year from now, um, if nothing's jumping out of us, we can certainly entertain uh, uh, extending that time frame uh, uh, as far as the next approval would be. Um, you guys understand that? I, I do now. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Robert has his hand up. Wayne? Go ahead, Wayne. Robert. Wayne, uh, before we set the term, what's the uh, anticipated construction? Because usually we do one year upon completion. Oh, the, the, the time frame for this project being built out? Yes. Um, when, you're, when you're going to start construction. Uh, um, if, if we had approval uh, effectively now, or put it this way, if, if we knew that our overall plan, which sounds like overall, it's acceptable, um, we would complete uh, permit application drawings to the building department within the next, I would say, three or four weeks. And then um, start of construction from them, I would I would partly look to you, Ginny, as to what your goal, goals would be of actually getting into it. I know it's, there's if, some if uncertainty. We could, if we could do it in a year, that would be fabulous. Okay. You're, saying, you're saying complete in a year, Jenny. If we could, yes. Uh huh. So, Wayne, why don't we do like an 18 month term? Because that'll allow them at least to get going, get the com project completed, have it filled, and we may have a few months of tenants in so then we can reevaluate. And also, with, with the pause, that's it. This is Wayne Platt. Robert, I agree with, with the pause in, in effect right now. Uh, there may be some some delay in getting the project up and up and you know being built as it is so i i agree how's everybody else feel about that 18 months everybody this is sue everyone's got their thumbs up okay good thank you all right um so under seeker this is a type two action uh it's so no further review of the board is required, Sue? Is that what I'm looking at here? This is Sue, yes, that is correct. Okay, Wayne Platt back here again. So at this time, I will make a motion that we approve item number four for a period of 18 months uh, with, Sue, can you go, can you just address the, the board policies that we're gonna deal with? I, was, I should have done that in, in the beginning, sorry. I will. The board policies would be number six, signature on the plans, board policy seven and seven A, which are active approvals, uh, board policy 14, which is the dig safely, board policy 22, which is the required uh, carbon monoxide detector, the 23, which is bluestone sidewalk protection, 25, which is the installation of an ox box, and 26 where building permits are obtained where necessary. Okay, this is Wayne Platt again. Thank you, Sue, for that. So uh, with all of those board policies that Sue has described, I'm, I'm making a motion that we approve item number four for a period of 18 months. And uh, do I have a second on that? Wayne, this is Sue. Yeah. Again, um, do you want to add into that motion that their refuse plan be brought back to staff for review and approval? I will include that as well, uh, as Sue has just described. Yes, thank you. Um, so I would also say lighting. As well. I would also say lighting as well, if any is proposed. Okay. Did you hear that, Jordan and Ginny? If any lighting is proposed, it would come back as well. Yes. All right. So with all of those. This is Wayne Platt again. With all those elements that we've just uh, described, uh, that is a motion. Do I have a second on that? Charles Palacco, second. Okay, okay Charles Palacco with a second. Uh, all in favor? Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco? Charles Palacco is a yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Harry Joe Wiltshire? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Okay, that motion is approved. Jordan and Ginny, thank you very much. For Wonderful. Thank tonight. you so much, everybody. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. All right, moving on, we're into 
Let me see here. Bond release item number five is 20 Cedar Street. This is the E squared project. Uh, there was a quest, a request for performance bond reduction. Section block of lot is 56.109-4-2.100, zone C2, mixed use overlay district, ward four, Rupco is the applicant owner. Chuck Snyder is here. Is Chuck unmuted right now? Yes, he is. Chuck, how you Hi, doing, Tyler? Good. Chuck Snyder, Director of Real Estate Construction for Rupco. Uh, this is a simple request. Again, uh, as I said earlier, we're about a month away from opening the doors on the building, and our site bond has been in effect for roughly two years. Um, the balance of the work on the site is some landscaping, top coat of paving, and some sidewalk work. We're, uh, we're really almost done, and probably by the time um probably by the time we put this in place it'll be it will be done so um we've uh we've asked for a very conservative reduction in the amount that the bond is covering um and i'm sorry i don't have any paperwork in front of me right now so i know you made some comments on it i read those today i take no exception your comments are spot on so um that's that's the request you could you could specify the uh, the amounts if you wish so please sure um so essentially what uh this is sue what rufco had done through the project architect was submit a spreadsheet of the cost that had been submitted for the original performance bond and i won't go line by line um if you saw what was sent out earlier today it included the analysis of the spreadsheet with a staff with a column for staff comment that I had added in. Um, bottom line, what we did was we changed some of the amounts on certain lines. We disagreed that 100% was complete on certain lines. Um, so the bond is now reduced. Uh, to an amount of $202,518. And that's from the original 700,000, uh, let's see, it was 700,000, seven, $778,803. Okay, this is Wayne Platt. Sue, so the amount that, that you are recommending that it be reduced actually exceeds what the request was that I'm reading here? The request that they asked it to be reduced to was $178,266. Um, I can go through basically the lines. Um, we concurred with their uh, call out lines, one through number 13. Um, they involved mostly the removal of the existing building demolition, uh, removal of asphalt, removal of sidewalks and concrete curbing, um, removal of existing utilities, light poles, grass areas that existed in shrubs, uh, traffic signs that were on site and so forth, fencing. Um, so we, re we agreed with the, all of those. I added in a note that on number 13, which is asphalt paving. Uh, they still have, they have the sub base and the binder installed. Um, the only the top coat remains. We added in after our site inspection that once the top coat layer of asphalt is surface is applied, that the existing cleanouts and casings that uh, currently are well above grade will be cut and made flush to the surface. That was okay. the one comment there. On line 14, which was sidewalks, um, we noted that during site inspection, it was noted that the sidewalk must be extended along the full length of Cedar and a short length along Iwo Jima Lane. In addition, there's a short distance at the end of the sidewalk on Cedar where it meets the next property at 579 Broadway, that's the corner lot there, um, where the sidewalk had to be extended to make a continuous pedestrian pathway. The ADA ramp at the intersection of Cedar and Iwo Jima Street uh, needs to be uh, put installed with tactile warnings and the existing stop sign at that intersection would need to be relocated to the inside of the new sidewalk area. 
Um, in addition, we noted that temporary power lines, power poles and structure, other infrastructure had to be removed from the inside of the sidewalk area along Cedar Street at the northeast corner. So they had requested a reduction there of 80%. We backed it down to 75%. Um, so that increased that amount then to 11684 So that okay. was that. Okay, this is when. So, so what was the what was that figure that you're you've come to the two hundred two thousand? What was it? Two hundred and two thousand five hundred and eighteen dollars. Okay, that's what your request. That's what you're suggesting that the bond remained at remain at then. Correct. The left. Right. And does yes. Repro agree? Yes. Fine. Okay. You put a lot of effort. This is changing again. It sounds like you put a lot of effort into into going over crunching all these numbers. And uh, if the applicant is is good with it, I'm good with it too. Um, does anybody have any other questions for Sue or the applicant on this from our board? No. No. Wayne. All right. So um, thank you, Sue, for that. Uh, so at this time, I will make a motion that we. Uh, go along with uh, staff's recommendation of a 75% reduction, uh, which will be $202,518 to remain on the performance bond for item number five. Does that suffice, Sue? It's not It's not a 75% reduction, Wayne. It was just 75% for that one line item. So I don't know what the, the overall percentage of reduction is, but it would be re, it would the bond remaining would be two hundred and two thousand five hundred and eighteen dollars. Thank you for clarifying that. I second. Um, okay, second by Robert Jacobson. Um, all in favor? Wayne Platt is a yes. Uh, Robert Jacobson. Yes. Chuck Palaco. Palaco, yes. Mary Jo Wiltshire. Yes. Pat Gillis. Yes. Okay, motion is approved. Thank you, Chuck, and thank you, Sue, for, for working on those numbers. Uh, good. Right, good seeing you, pal. I'm out. Yes. All right. Thanks. Okay, moving on here. We have. Uh, Okay, we're going on to item number six. This is our final item, right, Sue? Yes, that's correct. Item number six is a zoning code amendment. We have a referral from the Common Councils. Um, they have sought lead agency status on seeking or requesting comment on the proposal to include 10% affordable housing citywide. Um, we've, we've had We've had this before our board uh, appeared last month. We've uh, asked, uh, we've been given some more time to take a look at it and offer some feedback um, on, on the uh, recommendation of the council. Um, anybody, does anybody just jump right in? Who wants to start with this? Anybody have any comment on this? How they feel about it? If, uh, this is Wayne Platt again. Before before we, we go any Kevin, further with this, uh, what's that? Kevin Roach had his hand up. Okay, Kevin, but go I'll, ahead. Bud. This is Kevin, but I'll let you speak first, Wayne, if you want to say something. Why don't you go ahead? I got to look up Kyla's uh, email to uh, outlining what uh, what we're able to consider with this. So, Kevin, go ahead, buddy. Very good. This is Kevin Roach. I just was uh, continuing on the thoughts I had last uh, last month that I think the 10% number um, is just um, overbearing if the project is small. If it is a project of um, nine <laughs> units or less, I don't feel there should be any requirement. If there's a project of between 10 and 19, I could see it reasonable to request one unit. Um, leaving it at 10%, anything over 10, 11 through 19 would mean there would have to be two. 
I just think that would be too cumbersome of a number. And honestly, it would be that decrease from the, from those two units would be passed along to the other um, the other units in the building. And I think it would just be too much of an increase. So I propose from nine or below, there be none required. From 10 to 19, there be one required. From 20 to 29, there be two required. And then from 30 and above, I would be fine with the 10% suggestion forward. I just think it, uh, it's just too cumbersome that anything, it's that 10% or more number that really jumps up that extra apartment for all those small units. So I was just doing some numbers and thought that would be more reasonable than just a blanket 10% on the smaller units, the lower number of units. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Wayne. Wayne, this is Sue. I just forwarded an email to the board members. There was a comment that came through at five o'clock this evening. Um, I've spoken with uh, Dan Gartenstein and I'm going to read that comment. You can read along uh, with me. It is from Victoria Padolino. Um, it is she's with the law offices of Rodenhausen, Cal, and Palodoro. And it is addressed to you, Wayne. It is dated, well, it says it's dated March 18th. I believe that is a typo, and it's today. Um, it says, Dear Chairman Platt and members of the planning board, this firm represents several entities which own property in Uptown Kingston that would be impacted by the proposed affordable housing requirements proposed by the Common Council and then in parens and quotes proposed legislation. Please consider these comments as part of the planning board's discussion this evening. The proposed legislation disproportionately burdens smaller de development projects. Section 405-8A in parens one of the proposed legislation requires 10% of units to be set aside in any development project that includes five or more units. As no provision is made for half units, developments of five multifamily units would be required to set aside one full unit as affordable or 20% of the total units. The same number of units that a project double its size would be required to set aside. This requirement will create a disproportionate burden on smaller projects and should be reconsidered. The second comment, the proposed legislation should include an exemption for adaptive reuse projects. It is generally understood that renovation of existing historic structures with asbestos and the need to retrofit utilities is more costly than building new. We believe the existing provisions in the mixed use overlay district for affordable housing was an attempt to provide owners of existing historic buildings in the stockade area with an incentive to rehabilitate such structures by allowing them to be used for residential uses where such residential uses were not otherwise allowed. And there's a footnote which reads, the City Zoning Board of Appeals disagreed with this and it's March 13th. 2020 decision, which is being appealed. A copy of our submission to the ZBA supporting our assertion is enclosed herewith. Then they go back to the reading. Requiring affordable units places additional burdens on such development. If residential uses are permitted throughout the city underlying C2 zoning district, there is less of an incentive to save and restore existing structures. We request that the city amend the proposed legislation to exempt adaptive reuse projects from the affordable housing requirement to encourage the rehabilitation of historic structures and the cohesiveness of the areas such as the Kingston Stockade Historic District. Thank you for your consideration. Sincerely, Victoria Polidoro, and she copied on that her client. Uh, Dan, do you want to comment on that? Uh, in private, uh, you had sent a, uh, a, a link for a phone number for an attorney client. Um, 
discussion and we certainly can discuss this um, in that context. Um, there are certain things that I would not discuss in the public meeting with regard to that letter. Um, I have no problem with the two submissions being made part of the record, despite the fact that they were submitted after your deadline, um, given that there's a 45 day window for this board to um, make comment um, and therefore it doesn't prejudice anybody to um, you know, consider the submissions. The second submission um, was submitted to the ZBA as a pleading on behalf of Ms. Palladoro's client. Um, as she indicated in her letter, the Zoning Board of Appeals um, has issued its decision and rejected her reasoning that is set forth in that letter. Um, you all have a copy of the ZBA's decision, and at this point, the ZBA's decision is what's referred to as, you know, the law of the case. So the arguments that she present have already been rejected. Do we need to go to a attorney client no. privilege phone? I don't see why. Okay. Um, Mary Jo? Mary Jo, you had a question? No. Okay. okay. So um, what, are the, what are the comments from other board members? I mean, I obviously made my thoughts known last week, and I think Kevin has been an, uh, a, uh, an advocate, but I, I'm not really hearing from other board members who wanted the month to discuss this. So what are their viewpoints? This is Wayne Platt. Um, looking through all this, I, I you know, th these are, these are, this is something that was discussed in, uh, when we had uh, Dan Schuster as the consultant for, for you know, we were discussing the, the comprehensive uh, plan, uh, changing the zoning requirements back then. Um, one thing that I would like to see included in any language that gets sent back to the Common Council from us, I, I would like an applicant to have um, a type of relief valve, if you will, um, if they are looking to not um, that you know to, to have the uh, affordable housing aspect included in their project uh, back then we discussed um, some type of fee like we have maybe for the uh, um, the recreation fee that we have now for you know um, some something like that if, if an applicant is is looking not to ha uh, be be uh, required to have a uh, wants to get out of the requirement of uh, providing affordable housing that there be uh, a fee that that person that applicant could pay uh you know in lieu of having to so that that's what's jumping out at me on on this at that so uh, does anybody else have any thoughts on mary joe um yeah that's actually you know reading through the samples that sue had sent and i i think i made this comment last week also or last meeting um, I think there needs to be some kind of, uh, using your term, relief valve, um, you know, that we have the option as a planning board or the common council to just to, to give some relief to a developer if it's not appropriate for the for the um, affordable housing. I like Kevin's idea of, um, you know, assigning a certain number per per unit. That's that's also good as well. Um, but I think that, you know, we, we as the city should have the option of agreeing or disagreeing whether affordable housing is appropriate for a specific project. So I would like to see some kind of wording in there, not a strict 10% across the board. I, I don't agree with that. This is Wayne Platt again. Um, go ahead, Who, Matt, I'm sorry, you had a question? Yes, this is Matt Gillis. Um, I agree with Mary Jo, um, the way that she phrased that. And then what Kevin had with his numbers, um, I think that was reasonable. I mean, Wayne, the only thing I'd like to add is you're talking about a fee where I think Mary Jo and Kevin have mentioned, which I tend to agree with, it, instead of just a fee 
there's more, um, there's a relief on the part of the planning board where if an applicant came forward and said, look, this is the project, this is the building, this is the expense, or we're doing, we're going green, or we're spending X dollars in this area, therefore we want relief from the um, uh, uh, affordable housing unit, that the planning board would have the ability to um, uh, uh, waive that. Um, whereas, uh, you know, the planning board is various residents of the city, across the city. Many of us have all been appointed by various mayors. And I just think that you have a broad spectrum of people that takes politics out of it. Um, versus if you go to the common council, uh, I think a lot of times you're going to have more decisions that are going to be based on political uh, decisions, depending upon the size of the project, where the project is, what neighborhood it's in, uh, where I think the, the planning board, you have a good cross section and we should have the ability to say, does this work for this particular project in this particular area versus a different project or a different area? And I think that's what we've generally done over the past. Um, I, I do like Kevin's view with, with the numbers of units. I mean, I looked at the materials that Sue and Kyla sent, and I looked at, uh, we, we had New Paltz, we had Wawar Singh, um, uh, and, a, and a few others. Many of them talked about a 10 unit uh, um, uh, number, which is, uh, I think, what many of those towns uh, uh, used. Uh, I mean, a lot of the language was the same. I mean, they all kind of used each other as a template. but given that we're a city, we're one of the only taxing jurisdictions in the state that has a non-homestead tax rate, which is basically double for commercial properties. And any property that's four units or above, it's a double tax rate. So you can take a three family in a city that could each have two bedrooms each uh, and have six bedrooms, or you could have a four family that are all one bedrooms that are four bedrooms. You could have less people in a four unit than the, than the three family, yet the taxes are double on the four unit. And I think at 10 in the city of Kingston, the developers just can't make the numbers work. It's too low a number based on what the end result of the taxes are going to be, especially if it's a private development. And I think you're just going to stifle development. I just don't think it's good for the city. I think that number has got to get pushed up, like Kevin said. This is, this is Sue. Kevin, can I ask you just to restate your numbers again? Certainly. Um, I was thinking that any any uh, building with nine or less would not have to comply with any uh, required. They could, of course, if they wish to, but they don't have to. Anything from 10 through 19 would be the single unit. Anything with 20 to 29 would be two units. And anything at 30 or above, you'd have to go with the three or the 10% I'm kind of in agreement with the first letter that you read that just said the numbers just aren't going to work with that per, that split percentile. Anything of, you know, 10.1 is going to be rounded up to two. And I think that's where the numbers get. Actually, Kevin, it's Dan Gardenstein jumping in. 10.1, uh, 10 is not going to be rounded up to two. Um, I don't know where you're coming up with that. Um, no, I didn't say 10 would be rounded up. 10, 10, 10, 10 would be. It, if it says 10%, if you get to 11 units, that's 10 point, that's going to be 1.1. 1. Is that going to stay gonna at be, one? That's going to require one, one unit. Well, at what point does it does it round up? 10 point at at uh, 16 over. So basic rounding up numbers. So with 16, okay. you'd require two. Below okay. 15 and below, you'd require one. Okay. Well, that's not what I read. The first reading was at least the at least phrase so i thought it was 10.1 was going to round up to two a minimum of 10 percent i thought was going to round up to two at 11. i still feel that even if the rounding i just feel the numbers are a little bit too much that the other tenants the other units are going to make up for the shortfall caused by the whatever number of uh, subsidized housing. I also don't know exactly what those numbers would be. Last time I asked for some examples, but I, re I really don't know if it's a 
if it's a sixteen hundred dollar apartment, two bedroom apartment, what does what is the shortfall going to be caused by naming it as an affordable housing? Is it going to be half the rent? Is it going to be a thousand dollars instead of sixteen hundred? We really don't have the numbers to uh, available to us to make that decision. I mean, we, we, this is Mary Jo Wiltshire, and um, we want to increase affordable housing in the city of Kingston. And I think that this just, as we've discussed, you know, Robert and Kevin, I think this is going to hamper the development, not help it, um, the 10% across the board. I, I agree with Kevin. I think that, um, you know, you're going to get to a point where the developers are just not going to be able to make money. And that's really, honestly, the bottom line. They have it has to be profitable for them in order for them to do it. And we want to encourage them to provide affordable housing. And I, I don't think this, the way it's worded to me, doesn't feel like it does that. And this is Wayne Platt again. I mean, I I, th I agree with you, Joe. Uh, I we have. The, the two proposals that like Robert was either the fee or having the planning board uh, be the deciding uh, the, the deciding factor in whether it have to provide affordable housing or not. Um, what I what I worry about with and Robert, I agree with you that we've been we our, our board is is pretty well across the city, um, representative of all of all the city and. Uh, I just worry that, uh, and we have been out of, you know, haven't made it anything political about any of the, the decisions that that we've made. I just worry about, um, you know, any repercussions from from the the uh, you know the amount of latitude that the board will have when it comes down to those type of that that type of decision. I agree with that. I, I think the, pro the problem with the fee, the problem with the fee though is you're going to have a developer that will just come in and just write the check. Whereas if you allow it to have discretion to the board, the board could turn around and say, no, we're requiring this uh, housing component. This is what our code is asking us to do. And we don't see that what you're doing rises to the level of, of requiring an exception. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. I do too. Chuck? I, Chuck, I agree go ahead. with Kevin. I think the numbers and and that will work. I I agree that if it if it's too low, we're just going to be chasing developers away. This is Sue Vince. Do you have any comment? No, no sense in saying the same stuff all over again. That's I like Kevin's idea and and. Uh, what Robert and and that and said. So you were asking if Vince had to comment, right? No, I don't yeah. have. He, he okay. says no. I think everything was covered with. Uh, I like Kevin's proposal. I mean, I, I can understand. I had a four-unit building and it was rated commercial and put an extra 10 percent on i don't think that's that's an appropriate solution and i i since got rid of that building, but i can understand this is what i can understand the impact okay i mean i'll be honest with you Wait. i had a four unit uh, uh building just like vince as well i sold mine two years ago the numbers just got to a point with the commercial tax rate just didn't make sense so I can't imagine having a unit that would be affordable. So this is Wayne Platt again. Robert, just to just to clarify your your proposal, um, it would give the planning board the ability to waive the affordable housing component. Is that correct? Is that am I right in what you said? Look, if a proposal through the Common Council came through like Kevin, I would be happy. I believe with those numbers, but I have a feeling that that's not going to fly and the numbers are going to be a lot lower. 
if the numbers are a lot lower, then I think the planning board needs to have some type of uh, waiver mechanism. And even if the common council wants to allow the waiver instead of being a majority, maybe it has to be two thirds or, or maybe it has to be 90% of the board or unanimous. But there has to be some type of high threshold where the board can say, look, here's the building. We know it. We've studied it. Here's the expenses to develop it. This is what they want to do. This is what's needed in this area, or this is going to help a particular neighborhood uh, uh, grow by leaps and bounds. Therefore, having this affordable component just doesn't make economic sense compared to the project being approved as it's being presented and have the planning board have a high threshold where, you know, if it's 80% or 90% of the board, then, you know, the board at least has the option to say, we don't think that this is appropriate for this particular project. I and think having a mandate is going to uh, stifle development. Wayne, Wayne Platt here again. Um, uh, that that proposal that of yours, Rob, there, it, 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 it satisfies my my uh, wanting to be there to be a relief valve for an applicant, whether it's the planning board um, having that ability to waive or a fee schedule. I mean. If, if I'm 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 good with having the planning board being able to make that decision. That I mean, just as long as we have some type of relief out, um, so you know, for the for the applicants, you know. So Wayne, that, could, that's that. Mayor, this is Mary Jo. Um, maybe you could do a combination if they're asking for the waiver. Uh, I like Kevin's numbers, but then if they're asking for a waiver from those numbers, then they have to pay a fee, and we get to decide. If if that waiver is appropriate, and uh, this is Sue. I would I like Robert's suggestion of not doing a simple majority, but possibly a mar majority plus one vote on that waiver. Let's stay Robinson for a second. If I can just jump in, if we could just back up for a second, um, the first part of the legislation, which hasn't been addressed at all, and everything sort of uh, flows from there um is changing the current code from including only guidelines with regard to affordable housing in the mixed use overlay districts to requiring affordable housing uniformly across the city so that's the first inquiry is whether it is going to continue to only be required in the mixed use overlay districts or if it's going to be citywide so if we can just address that first and then move on to what the affordable housing requirement should look like wherever it's applicable. Um, I believe that would be helpful to the council. But I think the counter is if the, if it's going to be citywide, then allow the planning board to have the option to waive it where maybe there's certain parts of the city it's wouldn't the planning board doesn't feel that it's beneficial. Um, if you are if the common council is saying, well, we're just looking at the mixed overuse uh or overlay area well then that changes the discussion but right now they're talking about the entire city i don't feel that a mandate across this entire city is appropriate therefore rather than getting involved with the multiple zones we have across the city which hopefully are going to change if the common council ever gets us, uh uh this um uh city zoning update and master plan done but th that hasn't happened in the past 10 or 12 years I've been working on it. So at this point, I think if this planning board has the ability to waive it, then you can blanket the city because then as a planning board, we can say this doesn't make sense in this area because there may be not be any businesses. There may not be public transportation. There may not be services that, that would uh, benefit uh, uh, a um, affordable type unit. And Rob, you're talking about a waiver regardless of size or a waiver um, up to a particular number of units? I think there should be a waiver up to a particular number of units. I mean, let's be honest, if there's a 30 plus unit building that's being proposed, I don't think the planning board is going to waive affordable housing, nor do I think they should. Um, but when you're talking about numbers of 10, 15, 20, it depends on the economics of the project and also is it an adaptive reuse is it new construction these are all the things that the planning board looks at and that's why the planning board should have the authority
Anyone else in terms of making it uniform across the city as opposed to just in the current mixed use overlay district? I think it should be uniform across the city. This is Kevin. That was I Mary agree. Jo. I'm sorry, that was Mary Jo. Flat. This is Kevin. I Wayne agree. Flat. It should be I... uniform. Wayne okay, Platt, so I agree. Story, where, Wayne, where are you on that? Wayne Platt, I'm in, I'm in agreement with it going citywide. And Chuck? I, I, uh, this is Chuck. I agree. Uh, should go across the city. This is okay, Matt. Yeah. I'm also in agreement. Okay, Vince. I agree. Sir. And I think did I ask Kevin? Yes, this is Kevin. I agree. It should be citywide. So the first issue is that everyone agrees that it should be citywide. I assume everyone also agrees that it should be articulated in the code as a requirement rather than a guideline and it sounds like that would be subject to application to the planning board for a waiver up to a certain number of units well what's the difference between a guideline and a mandate because a guideline we as a planning board don't really have the authority to require affordable <laughs> housing correct the current use of the term guideline is just a poor choice of words that leads to um, confusion and litigation. <laughs> Understood. So the recommendation is to change it to a requirement. And if this board is indicating that that requirement should be subject to an application for a waiver, um, that certainly can be articulated in the letter to the council and the council should, can decide whether or not they are in favor of giving you that discretion. Um, as Sue indicated and as Rob indicated, um, something that would temper that discretion is if you required, you know, a super majority for um, a waiver, um, including any kind of ability to buy out of the requirement. Um, is something that um, I don't believe there will be um, any interest in um, and I believe will um, result in some significant backlash. Particularly if, if um, you are reserving the ability to waive the requirement on you know, good cause shown and that's an administrative decision that could certainly be subject to you know, review on an appeal. Okay. Are you still talking about the 10% 10, 10 across the board, Dan? Well, I'm not talking about, you know, the, the proposal that has been put forth by the mayor and by um, members of the council is a 10% across the board. Um, I certainly understand what um, is being discussed with regard to um, you know, um, buildings that don't have um, multiples of 10. Um, and certainly including in the legislation some language that clarifies um, what would be done in those circumstances certainly is not difficult to do. Um, whether it's rounding up, um, you know, um, or whether it's rounding down or whether it's specifying 10 to 20 requires one unit, 20 to 30 requires, you know, two units, whatever language, um, you know, needs to be included to clarify that really shouldn't be that difficult. Um, but I certainly understand where that, um, where that concern lies. So uh, the 10 percent number is um, what has been proposed by both the mayor and uh, by the council. So as a planning board member, I will be clear, I am not in favor of a blanket 10% across the city at the five unit that they're proposing right now. So are you suggesting that we tell them in a letter that we do not agree with this or that we do not agree with this and this is our counter proposal? I think that, um what you need to do is reach a consensus with regard to the various components of the legislation. 
Um, I think those concerns have to be articulated in a letter to the council. Um, and depending on whether you phrase it as an objection or suggestions, um, it either does or does not increase the majority that's required from the council. If you phrase it as an objection, you object to this legislation for these reasons. Okay, the council can still adopt it um, with a super majority, um, with a majority plus one. If you articulate your concerns and just state them as suggestions to the council, the council can either accept them or reject them, and then they um, and then it can be adopted with a five with a five vote majority. Um, but each of the components of the legislation should be addressed separately by this board to make sure there's a consensus on each one. If there isn't a majority of this board with regard to the specific objection, then it can only be a suggestion. Well, I'm willing, I'm willing based on our discussions, and I don't know how the other board members feel at this point, but based on what was presented to this board by the Common Council, I'm willing to go on record with an objection. And this is and just, this is I, I am also going under uh, uh, against it. This is Mary Wayne Jo. Here. Uh, yes, go ahead, I, Mary jo. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I I agree with Robert. I would I would uh, submit a, an objection. Wayne Platt here. Um, is that an objection? Just just to say you're objecting to it, or are we going to? some what our suggestions are to, uh, to I would make say that we have to object it and then go back with our recommendations yes yes I, I object to the 10% across the board specifically okay this is Sue so taking this in um, increments we've already decided that as a board, we have consensus of this being uniform across the city. That was number one. I think our next one is that. That's a, that's a suggestion. If we object to the current legislation, we object. Then we go back and we say, here's our recommendations. Recommendation one, it should be across the board. Recommendation two, these yes. are the numbers. Yes. So let's talk about, let's finish the objection. And I think we have to have a vote to see where the members are on the objection. So then we can talk about suggestions. Okay. Do you want to make that a motion, Robert? I'll make the motion. Okay. I'll second it. Wayne Platt here. Can, Sue, can you read that motion into record, please? What, how, how it is? Motion is from Robert Jacobson, and it is uh, to state to the Common Council the objection to the language as proposed um, for the affordable housing. We have a second by Chuck Palaka, right? Correct. So on discussion, um, are we, this is Wayne Platt here again. So on the discussion, if this does go through as an objection, do we tonight uh, highlight, illustrate what our proposals will be. Yes. So, so, yes, Wayne, that, does, would. that would be next. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Okay, anybody else have any uh, on, the, on the discussion? We have a motion and a second. Nobody? No one. All right, so, um, so a yes vote will be to object. If you if you if you're a yes, it will it will be to object to the proposal. Okay, make that clear. So uh, I am going to vote yes. Wayne Platt votes yes. Charles Palaco. Charles Palaco votes yes. Robert Jacobson. Yes. Mary Jo Wiltshire. Yes. Matt Gillis. Yes. The yeah. motion is is carried. All right. So let's now discuss. We already have some some bullets out there to uh, what we're looking at here. Um, 
So we're, we're okay with having the affordable housing requirement be proposed. This is Wayne Platt again, to be citywide, correct? Is that something we right. include that? I believe, this is Sue. I believe Robert wanted to make that as a motion under our objection, correct, Robert? Well, I don't know that, how do you want to do this? I don't think you need a motion. I think we're just going to go back in the letter saying we objected and we would make these suggestions as to legislation that the planning board okay. would either approve or would like to see revised. All right, so this is a motion for each item that you outline or each suggestion. The way it works is once you outline them all, you um, would pass a motion to um, accept those suggestions. And then if the council accepts those suggestions, um, they only need a regular majority rather than a super majority. If they reject those suggestions, they need a majority plus one. Okay. Wayne Platt here again. So, so Dan, just so I'm, we have to vote on each one of these, at, like, and then vote on it as an entire package to send to them? Is that what you're saying? I think the easiest way to do that would be to go through them one at a time and, and you know, vote in terms of, I mean, it's not technically a motion, it's, um, you know, securing a consensus of the board. Um, and then you wrap them all together into one motion. So Wayne Platt here again, this, the, the way I've, I've, I've taken everybody's uh, comments into, we have, uh, for me, it looks like we have three things that we're looking at. We have the affordable housing requirement is to be proposed to be citywide. Um, we're looking for the planning board to have the ability to waive the requirement, whether it be with a super majority vote of the members present, and also, are we looking at establishing a numbers uh, like uh, around like Kevin Roach has proposed? Does that seem to be the consensus of the board, those three items that we're looking at? And if there's anything else, please, please interject. I, I just Mary Jo, I agree with that. I agree with that, Wayne. Well, let me just jump okay. in a second again, uh, Dan Garden scene. Rob, what you had said was that you did not believe that um, the planning board should or would waive the requirement over a certain number of units. What I didn't hear you say was whether or not they could. Okay, and that's you know that's my question. Um, I accept I, I that the circumstances would be very rare when you would. The question is whether you are suggesting that you retain the authority to waive the requirement regardless of the size of the development or do you want to limit that to buildings of less than let's say 30 units i would say that that authority should be limited to smaller buildings i think any large-scale project it, the affordable housing if it's if it's new construction large uh, uh complex it should be a mandate I, I'm, I'm, say, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. At? What number are you looking at? Well, I think in um, Kevin's example, uh, I'm just trying to, and maybe Sue can help us, but some of our larger projects that we've done in the city, um, uh, such as the Rupco projects, um, certainly um, the Kingstonian, which is on the horizon, um, I would say the average of those projects have all been at least 30 units or above, correct? Yes. So, I mean, I'm, I, I think that that's, you know, I, again, I don't have any of the data as to the economics of building these buildings and what the affordable housing combat component does, but I would think the 30 unit or above, um, you know, I, I, I would say start there. And if the city in a few years doesn't have certain amount of development, then the common council can revisit it. But um, I, don't, I don't think that any planning board really should uh, uh, be waiving for any unit, any size development that's that's larger than that. I think that was in Kevin's numbers too. It was, yes. This is Kevin Roach. I, that's the number I not necessarily mathematically came up with, but without having the exact numbers as Rob just mentioned, but anything sure. over 30 or so should definitely have to comply with the 10% number. 
And so I'm just throwing this out and I'm not picking on any particular person in the city, but I know we had some complexes that were smaller in the past, such as like Oakwood up on uh, Westchester Street. And we had, um, I know the, the, the Goki, uh, they had some, some projects, but they weren't anywhere near 30 units, correct? No, they were not. They were more around the, the 8 to 15. Yeah, and those are the complexes that I just don't feel should, should um, you know, have this, this type of a mandate. Because they're just, they're just, they're small. Well, with Kev, using Kevin, this is Sue again, with Kevin's numbers, um, let's just run them through again. He said nine or less, they would not have to comply with providing an affordable unit unless they wanted to, of course. Um, and then he had 10 to 19 units would require one affordable unit. 20 to 29 units would have two units of affordable housing required and 30 or above would either be three units or 10%, whatever the number is. And that 30 is the number that we're talking about triggering it being mandated to 10% now. I, and I mean, is, I, I, again, I'm is, just shooting, shooting from the dark, but I mean, even at 10 units, I, it would be a, a, a math. And, and I think that if the planning board had the discretion, then, you know, if a developer said, look, here's the math and it just doesn't work with 10, Whereas it may work for 15, if the planning board has discretion, right. then I'd be okay with those numbers. Right. This is Sue. I agree with you, and that's why these three suggestions have to be looked at and considered in their, you know, compreh comprehensively at the end. But I think what Dan Gartenstein is asking is to go through each one, gain a consensus, and then at the end form a final. Uh, vote on all of them together. This is Kevin Roach again. If I can just make one more observation that I don't know how units are defined. We could have a, a unit or a building which has 18 three bedroom units and then one single bedroom unit. I don't want to get it too much into the uh, minutia here, but I don't want to see us taking advantage of and that way either where someone just throws in a single closet sized unit just to get through the planning process. Dan, is there some average or something that we should be using to decide the number of units? The number of units per unit? The additional language you put in other than 10% is just gonna hamper your discretion even when an application comes in front of you for a waiver. I think that it's a case by case basis and the property owner is gonna have to convince you that um, what they are proposing is appropriate. And that goes for um, developments that are not even contesting the affordable housing. You still have to review site plan. And if they come before you on a site plan review and say, um, this is our plan, we're you know, proposing a 40 unit building with four, four, you know, with four apartments that are gonna be affordable, but each of the four affordable you know, apartments are going to be you know, 500 square foot studios, you're, gonna, you know, you're not gonna buy that. I agree. You're gonna, you. you're gonna address that during your review of site plan. Very, this is Kevin, thank you, Dan, for clarifying that. And uh, this is Mary Jo. I'm sorry. Go ahead, uh, this is Mary Jo. Are we um, going to also recommend that um, so that we don't get taken advantage of? And um, if they want to get, you know, if they don't want to provide affordable housing, is it going to be a fee in lieu of? Like there's some of the examples that Sue and Kyle had sent around. They had a fee in lieu of the affordable housing unit. Are we considering that? Is anyone else interested in um, making, um, in, in uh, providing that as an option? Um, or is I, it just job? I personally am not. I think that that's a slippery slope and I think it's can be perceived by the public as somebody basically paying to play. And I, I don't think that's really what the city wants. I, I mean, obviously we want affordable housing. We know we need affordable housing, 
we're just as a planning board my my opinions tonight and decision is I'm trying to balance the affordability and providing that against the economics of not stifling development. So I don't really think we're a fee. I just, I don't agree with that. I, I, I would rather stick to Kevin's model, have the planning board have the ability to either waive or not waive, and, 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 and that's it. Okay, where's everyone else on um, the option of a buyout? Here. I'm not in favor of the buyout. Kevin, Chuck. This is Stu. Chuck, what is your position on the buyout? I'm not in favor of a buyout either. Okay. okay. And Reed is a no. Mary Jo. Um, that's fine. I was just asking if we were considering it. So uh, if that's the consensus of the board, I'm fine with that. Vince, do you have an opinion? No, I agree with Robert's assessment on that. Okay. Okay. So, well, the so consensus it sounds to me like there's basically consensus on what your suggestions would be. Um, you know, that it would be, um, you know, a 10% requirement with specific numbers built in um in accordance with what um you know kevin was speaking about with you know um that the requirement would be waivable um on good cause shown to the planning board uh, for property up to 30 units i think the only outstanding issue at this point would be whether that waiver would need a super majority um and I certainly believe that requiring the supermajority uh, would make it more likely that the council would accept your recommendations um, rather than um, um, you know, voting to overrule them with a supermajority. Dan, um, a supermajority would be the majority plus one, correct? Correct. I agree with that and i would even i mean knowing this board and having been on it for the period of time that i'm on i think the board really works hard to to, to listen to all the board members and really um not uh, to listen to everyone and really make sure the board as a whole is on board so i would even be willing to go to a higher number like you know 75 percent or i just you know i'm i would leave that to what the council uh, would desire. I mean, we can certainly make a recommendation supermajority, but if they came back with a higher number, I, I, I would be okay with that. Practically speaking, I'm not sure that it makes much of a difference, Rob. Right. I mean, okay. because, you know, um, the difference between a majority plus one and 75% of a board, I mean, you know, someone did the math. I'm not the mathematician here, but I think it's the same thing. Okay. Actually, this is Kevin. A majority plus one would be four to one, which is eighty percent. Okay. That, that's what I thought. So we're already there. I'm not a math guy, so I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one flat here now. So we're, again, we're back to those. We're back to three three basic thoughts right here, right? We've already talked about and agreed that the affordable housing requirement is proposed to be citywide. That's something we've all agreed on. We've already voted right. that, right? Yes. Um, all right. So, are, are we good? inclined to? Uh, all right. Um, I'm inclined to go with Kevin's numbers here on on the thresholds of of uh, when affordable housing would kick in. Is everybody good with that? I'll read them into record again. It's less than nine, no requirement. 10 to 19 would be one unit required. 20 to 29 would be two units. And 30 plus would be 10% of the total number of units proposed. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. With, and that would be without the waiver. No waiver. Without the waiver. And this I'll, is Kevin, I'll get to the could, waiver. This is Kevin, ahead, if I can just correct, correct you, Wayne. You just said uh, less than nine when it actually it would, would be nine or less. So you want to have nine? Yes. I'm sorry, nine and, or less would be no. Right, and then if we Correct. could also use Dan's method of rounding 
So we could know of those people who once you get up to 35 or 36, whatever the standard rounding process would be. Okay. Um, that sounds good. So we're good okay, with so the, we're, we're good with the ranges, but the planning board can make an exception only for the first two ranges, correct? The, or the, the yes, the nineteen and the twenty to twenty nine, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. All right, so we're all in agreement on those numbers, right? the the one that proposed. Everybody's good. What's up, any everybody? Yes. Vince? Yes. Yep. All right. So moving on to number three here, um, uh, the planning board will have the ability to the affordable housing requirement with a supermajority vote of members present, and applicants should uh, show good cause to the planning board, and this would be up to 30 units. Okay, Wayne, just for clarification, it's not a supermajority of the members present, it's a supermajority. Supermajority, I'll, I'll take that out of members. Supermajority vote by the planning board. Okay. Because if someone's absent, you still need the same number of votes. Correct. Robert, is that what you're saying? Is that basically mirror what you're saying? Yeah, that was Kevin's number, and we have the ability to wave up until 30, anything 30 and above. The city as a whole, it sounds, wants affordable housing okay. at a 10% at a number. Yes. Okay. Is everybody in agreement with that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yes. All right. Does anybody, are we, are we going to go with just those three, those three items, or do we have to include something else? Everybody's good with those three? Well, the other issue you need to address, okay. and Ms. Palladoro brought it up, is whether a, um, any kind of exemption would be allowed for an adaptive reuse. Um, what I would suggest is that... Um, I, I think an adaptive reuse, though, Dan, would likely be a smaller project under the 30 number. Well, and that's what I was going to say. It falls within your discretion anyway, and they could present to you documentation with regard to excessive costs associated with the adaptive reuse that could prompt you to waive um, the requirement. So I don't necessarily believe that you need to further address the adaptive reuse issue, but it has been raised to you in that letter, so you should discuss it. But this is Wayne Platt again. Dan, wouldn't that be showing good cause to the planning board for, for requesting a waiver? Yeah, that's what Rob and I just said. Okay. Now, Dan, Dan, obviously, if this is discussed by the Common Council, do we need to flag that in our letter that adaptive reuses will be considered toward waivers so they know that we had this discussion? It's up to you. My assumption is that um, Ms. Paula Doro is going to submit the same letter to the Council um and um it's i'd rather be addressed in that context you can put it in your letter just to establish that you discuss it and that you don't believe it's necessary as long as you have the discretion to waive um that that i would like to do sue just so that the council realizes the extent of the discussions that the planning board had in this and wayne flat here again everybody's Everybody's good with adding that language? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. All right, so we I think we have something to go with here to, to ship off to the Common Council. Does anybody have any further discussion on this? We'll, we'll, we'll package this together right now and uh, come and take a put on it. Everybody's good? I'm yes. good. I think this was a good, healthy conversation. Um, Sue, do you have everything written down what we're going to be voting on, or do, you, do we should I just go ahead here? I don't know if you've written anything down. I've written a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the motion would be 
that the planning board objects to the language as it's proposed, and we have already taken the vote on that, with the suggestions that the affordable housing be applied on a uniformly across the city, that there be a provision within the language that it would be waivable by the planning board with good cause shown up to 30 units by a super majority, which equates to a majority plus one of the voting of the voting membership, and that the numbers would follow uh, would follow Kevin's uh, recommendation. Nine or less unit number of units would not have to comply with affordable housing unless the developer chose to do so. 10 units, 10 units to 19 units would be required to provide one unit of affordable housing. 20 units to 29 units would require two units of affordable housing. And 30 or more would require three or 10% of the number. That 10% could would be rounded using uh, Dan's method of standard rounding practice. And I would also include a discussion was held on the adaptive reuse. That's what I have in submission. Okay. Everybody's good with that as, as, as what we're gonna be and, sending off to the council. And the discussion on the adaptive reuse is that if we would be able to have the ability to waive based yes. on and we can waive anything under 30 units. Is that, am I correct on that? Yes. Correct. Okay. okay. Any, any, I'm going to make, I'm going to make that a motion. What Sue Wayne. just read into record. Wayne, yes. this is Sue. Before you make that a motion, we just need you to do the action on the seeker. The council had requested that they, that we, Incur with them acting as lead agency. Um, at this time, I'll make a motion that we concur with the Common Council acting as lead agency with this proposal. Second on that. Mary Jo. Hi, Mary Jo. Uh, all in favor? Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco. Charles Palacco is a yes. Mark Jacobson? Yes. Ray Joe Wiltshire? Yes. Gillis? Yes. Okay. Motion is carried. Okay, now I can move on to that, that other issue then, Sue? Correct, yes. All right, so we've already made a, a motion and, a, and, and we, we've kept, we've passed that. We're objecting to. Uh, the language as as proposed, right? The, the initially we made that clear. That's yes. been done. All right. So moving on to our suggestions, as Sue had read into record, uh, I'm going to make that a motion that we approve that. Uh, do I have a second on that? Matt Gillis. Palaco, second. Oh. Gillis, okay. And no, if there's any further discussion on this right now? No? Okay. Uh, so that is a motion with a second. All in favor? Uh, Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco? Is a yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Ray Joe Wiltshire? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. That is carried. All right. Um, thank you. And Dan, thank you for your input on that too, pal. Good luck, everyone. Glad you got through it. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Um, anything else before us, Sue? That is it for this evening. Um, I want to thank everybody's input. Uh, the, the entire board was uh, very helpful in formulating our opinion, what we're sending off to the Common Council. Um, also, uh, Kyla and Sue, thank you for uh, getting all of our visuals up and running here so we can 
get a better idea of what we're dealing with. And uh, so at this time, I will make a motion that we uh, adjourn. Second. Just, just question before we adjourn. Um, Stu, have would there been any decisions made with regard to our summer meetings yet? Uh, I I know we missed uh, a few, but I know no, we also want to meet in uh, August. We are staying at this point. We are staying with our normal calendar as we would. So there okay. will not be a meeting in August at this time. Okay. All right. Thank you, Robert, for that. So do I have a second on the motion to adjourn? Second. Second by Robert Jacobson. Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Polacco? Yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Joe Wiltshire? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Okay, motion is carried. Sue, I will see you on Wednesday to sign those maps, okay? Yes. Okay, and uh, that is.